Hello everyone and welcome to my podcast. So finally doing my first episode and the first person that I wanted on my podcast is someone who has urged me to do this for a very long time. And I've been like, no, 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 no. And he was like, you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. So I was like, in his honor, I had to have the great Trevor Colt on for my first guest. So Trevor, thank you so much for coming on. Well, it is about time, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Uh, I love doing podcasts. Yeah, I love chatting. I love chatting. I'm a gobshite, so I love chatting. It comes naturally with me. Thanks I, for I know. <laughs> it's like not a, it's not a surprise to me. So uh, look, uh, what I'm going to do is before we get we get off chatting about different things, different subjects, I want you to let people who don't know who you are uh, uh, know a little bit more about you. So if you can. Let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. Imagine you're sitting on the on the couch, right? You're lying on the couch with your therapist, and and <laughs> where did it all start? Or where did it all go wrong, Trev? Where did it all start? Well, uh, that that that's an open question. That's quite a long one. Uh, well, I start off my journey uh, in, in outside of Belfast on Donald. Um, I was growing up at a time where a lot of people I knew were joining paramilitary terrorist organisations, and. Coming from a military family, I didn't want to go down that road, so I just decided to join the army and and, uh, and go abroad and try and do something different. Yeah, where did it all go so, wrong? <laughs> in the army. <laughs> well, 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 thank God that you did. So, so how old were you? So you had a regular schooling, right? You went to school. Were you yeah. like? Was there any conflict at school? Were you ever bullied? Was there ever like? Because, because you know, I know what it's like. Like for a lot of people that didn't grow up in that that time there's a lot of tension between Catholics and Protestants in mm. Northern Ireland and, and well, all, all around, right? The British Isles and in Ireland. Mm. So what was it like for you? And, and how old were you when you, when you did sign up, when you did go in the army? Well, first of all, um, I grew up in Ballybean estate, a, a loyalist estate. Um, there was never any trouble. Um, there, before I left Northern Ireland to go to, go to England and join the military, we started to get, uh, is it murals done on the gable ends of houses? But you know what? Um, they were stunning. I mean, regardless of what we're about, King Billy, the, the pictures on the walls were stunning. I mean, done by proper artists. Uh, but there was no trouble, honestly. I mean, there was times where I was playing football at the front of my house. I would hear, first I would see a big puff of smoke in Belfast, which was about seven miles away from Ballybean, I think. Probably seven miles, eight miles away. And then you'd hear a bang. And we could see the explosions going off in Belfast, but um, it never it never came anywhere near us. My The housing state where I was from, everybody knew each other. It was a family type. It, it was lovely, mate. And uh, I went to school in a place called Scrabble High School in Newton Ards, uh, which is about another four miles from my house. And I went there on a bus. And Scra Scrabble, the, Scrabble High School has now been knocked down. It's now like a development. Hmm. But, and by the way, bullying at school, Matthew... I have ginger hair. I got called everything on mattress pubes, ginger, gold. I got called everything. This was this was classed as racism before there was a racism. All right. So I've had everything thrown at me. You know, rusty roof, dirty sailor. It's had it all. Hey, but do then, you know what? It's it's funny, you know, because I was talking about, to someone about this the other day and about the fact that um when you it, it doesn't matter what is physically different about you or even if it's not physical, they will. School kids are the most brutal group. You will certainly when I was growing up in England, just totally brutal. But, but they would look and they'd say, "Well, you know, he's too tall. He's got a big nose. He's got sticky out ears. He's this. He's that." They'll find some thing to to bully you with, right? It's not just about a race, right? It's about that they, they will find they're kind of brutal, and you just have yeah. to get on with it, right? You just you, you have to get on with it and live your life. Well, moving from going from Dundonald, Ballybean to going to Newton Arts to school, Newton Arts school, uh, high school, I, because I hadn't done any exams or anything, I got put straight into the dunce class. I was in the class with all the retards. I had a guy who was seven foot two, I had a guy who was two foot four, I had a woman with a big mole with like a brush out. So we had the, my class was filled with freaks. I mean, you could have made a movie about that. It was just a freak class. And I was the, and I was the ginger. So I belonged in that class. I was the freak. But were, the, were you like, these are my people? These are my <laughs> people, know. Trevor. Trevor, they're my people. <laughs> I had a guy in my class called Steve, Stephen, not my second name, who when you looked over, he was just drooling. And I was thinking, 
the this is my this is my level <laughs> my crew and you're like now i'm gonna join the army <laughs> you know yeah. and then i'll well, be with my people too the army accept people with degrees they accept people that can't even spell their name and they accept gingers so yeah <laughs> god bless him god bless the british army for accepting gingers so so how old were you when you said that you wanted to or you or you applied you went over you went to england to get in the army no, not originally. Uh, I went to Palace Barracks. I think it was 18. I went to Palace Barracks in Hollywood here. In, uh, well, not here, in Belfast. And went in there. Um, had, to go through, had to go through a test, but it was a paper test where you were graded. You answered all these questions. You were graded. And then they give you a massive printout. You know the old printouts? Massive printout of all the regiments that you were qualified to join with your results. Um, and I originally, originally wanted to join the Household Cavalry. Because huh. I'd been to London when I was younger on my first abroad trip to England. Uh, went to London and I seen them standing there and they looked immaculate and I thought I want to do that. Thank God I didn't. Only because of the only because of the ceremonial and the amount of nonsense they get thrown at them. They're yeah. great. Household cavalry are, are a great unit, but um, I'm glad I didn't join. I'd have spent my life bullying and shining things Uh as well they as are combat. impressive, though. I mean, th there's yeah. nobody that does pageantry like the British, right? It's it's really impressive to see, you know, those the beautiful uh, is it the lifeguards, right? That they yeah. have those cuirasses, yeah. and it, it's it's really quite something. Yeah, but I, I didn't join them, but because when I when I'm in the recruiting office, the guy in there was a Royal Irish Regiment guy, and he went, "You want to join my regiment, son? Do you know where we are? Look at this. We're in Cyprus at the minute. We're doing canoeing. We're doing paddle boarding. We're doing all these." Look at that jet ski and see that. Show me a video, and I'm like, "Oh wow, this is brilliant!" Yeah, he conned me. Yeah, <laughs> so I joined. <laughs> you like, like it's a yeah. You're like it's a total country club. You know, everyone knows that when you join the army, that's all you do is kayak. Yeah, uh, yeah, skiing. Yeah, yeah. what sports so do you like, son? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you go over there. You you join the regiment, and what was life like for you? I mean, was it a shock when you first? No, the physical element was that a shock, or was any of it surprising? No, well, um, my dad's from the military, so was my mother. So I grew up in in a time where I got room inspections for my pocket money. So I knew how to clean. I knew how to build. I knew Everyone, how to... By the way, every kid should do that as well. Like right now, I'm just putting it out there. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it was how I grew up, and and. Uh, I, I had discipline. I would never answer my dad. I tried to. I would never answer my dad back. Wouldn't do anything that I know. I he's probably going to watch this and go, "You did answer me back." Yeah, yeah. But I was a scared too, and I ran away. You know. I mean, I did come down the house. My stairs in my home. I put my feet inside an action man tank, and I went down the stairs and through the pane of the glass, and then ran away and hid from my dad. So you know. But I had a. Uh, I would say probably a little bit of a strict upbringing, but it was great because. My parents took me everywhere. I did martial arts, Northern Ireland. Uh, I used to go to a club called Muraquai, Muraquai Judo Club, which still exists. And I went there and I, I, I was focused on it. I, bec I became the Northern Ireland champion at, at Judo. Uh, and then I got picked for the Northern Ireland team to go down to the South of Ireland to take on the Irish team. And I beat them. I became the All Ireland Judo champion. And I loved it. I loved that element. But then... Billy Coulter, God rest his soul, uh, kicked me out of the club for fighting. Uh, it's not weird. Get kicked out you, of got judo club. you got kicked out of a judo club for fighting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I was the current North Ireland champion. And I went to another club in Newton Ards, uh, Ards Judo Club. And I stayed there for a while, but then I just gave it up. And I took up huh. running in cross country. And I took up running in cross country. I joined Willowfield Temperance Harriers Running Club. And I loved it. I mean, I was already fit for martial arts. Uh, we became Northern Ireland champions. Uh, I went and did fell running. I became a Northern Ireland champion at fell running. I went over to Grasmere to compete in different internationals, and I beat the whole of the Irish team. So I, at the time, I was a Northern Ireland judo champion and the All Ireland fell running champion at the same time. And then I went to join the military, so I was already super fit. So you're an underachiever is what you're saying. You're an underachiever. By the way, I, I, I've known you for a long time now, and I didn't know any of that. Did you not? You, you no, never, no. You're asking me about, about my upbringing. I've never discussed it before. I, I've never yes. discussed it before. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah I, I enjoyed it. I still have my, my coach, Lawson Cochran, from Willowfield Temperance Hires, uh, who used to jump on my live streams, have a chat with me sometimes. Yeah, I, really? I owe a lot to him. 
Yeah, are you all out to him? He he he, he still coaches. He's a fantastic coach, though. Yeah, he That's said amazing. If you're going to run away from the police on, you may as well run towards a finish line. At least you'll get something at the end. <laughs> Do you know what? It's funny. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a I'm gonna say go a little bit and tell a story about one of my actually is my longest uh, oldest childhood friends who was um, who ended up being a grenadier guard. I'm not going to say who he's. I will have him on here eventually because his life is is very interesting. But he was he was for those of you in England, you'll understand this. So he was he's a West Brom fan. West Bromwich Albion fan, and he was going to a um, watch watch the Albion play Villa, and he was in the centre of Birmingham. Cut long story short, he goes into the McDonald's in there, and and he, he knows he's surrounded. He's got his colours on right, but he's surrounded by Villa fans. And he turns around and he sees these guys squaring up to him, and uh, and he was like, "I know what's going to happen." So he just like wallops the first guy and runs right. And he was a really fit guy. Like he was running, 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 running. And there's all these guys, like, he's like out of a movie, they're running after him. I think it's difficult for a lot of people these days to understand the way it was back then, right? Mm. He's running down the street, and this guy steps out, and he just goes, wallop, and he hits him. And he was a plainclothes policeman. Uh, and he, he, you know, my, my buddy was just in survival mode, right? You know, the, the, the heady days of football hooliganism. You know, he just walloped the guy and, uh, and carried on. And so that's, in the end... He was uh, he was in court, and they basically said, "You can either go and join the army." Actually, the the recruiter went with him and said, "Look, this is the kind of man we want in the army. We want someone who's who's aggressive, who will fight. You know, all those things that are like not not politically correct these days. But you know, mm. you need hard men to win and do the difficult things." And so he became a Grenadier Guard. And again, it was one of those things. And initially, he went in to join the Royal yeah. Marines. I think he wanted to, or, or the Parachute Regiment. When I have him on, I'll ask him about it again. But the guy that was um, the recruiter was a, was a Grenadier Guard. So, you know, the, he had this amazing amount of fitness. He had yeah. a lot of aggression. And actually, so he went into the Army like you did. And, and I just want you to talk a little bit about how it might have cha- like channeled you and, and channeled the individual that well, you are. When I joined up, um, as I said, I wanted to join uh, the, uh, the Household Cavalry because I liked how they looked. I was naive. Originally, I wanted to join the Parachute Regiment, but, and this is a fact, they are an aggressive fighting force and they're well known throughout Northern Ireland. And if I had joined them with my accent, I'd have been bullied like hell. Oh, so I just yeah. I just decided to go a different route. I ended up working with them in the end, uh, and they are exactly what it says on a tin. Very robust fighting force, and uh, they they get the job done. But uh, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it, but when, whenever I got to battalion, um, I wasn't allowed to speak. I was a sprog. Don't You need to earn the right to speak. I mean, these guys had been to Bosnia and seen ethnic cleansing and stuff. They'd been in real battles, and I just thought, wow, okay. And I just sort of I kept my mouth shut at the start, uh, but you have to earn the right to speak. You used to have to, you know, you've you've nothing to add. Just shut up and listen. Take note. I mean, and and I enjoyed it. It wasn't bullying. I mean, people said they were bullied. Uh, you got to. I mean, th- there was no telling off back in those days. Mate, if you messed up, you got a punch in the face. You dealt with it. It was done. The next day, back to being friends. There was no writing tales and charging people and finding people. They didn't exist. It was just that if you messed up, you got a punch in the face, and you didn't mess up again. And and but and though, I enjoyed... do you think though? Do you think though that that is? It's also what it was like when we were growing up, right? Like yeah. you'd have a disagreement with someone, you go and have a fight with them, and it was done. Like there yeah. wasn't any of this, you know. Like you say, you weren't afraid of getting sued. Most people yeah. would say, I, I know when when I was growing up, it was kind of like, well, you know, you got to slap him. Well, did you deserve it? That was the first question, right? Like, did yeah. you deserve it? And then it was the second question was, well, did you hit him back? Right. I mean, that, exactly. that was just the way that yeah. the, the, in the atmosphere that I grew up. Well, and, and I enjoyed it. I mean, uh, when I got there, my company commander had already heard that I, I, I was fit. I'd, I'd done all these competitions. When I got there, before I even had landed in camp, I'd already been entered into the company's cross company against other units. I, was, I had to go and pick up my uh, battalion colours, regiment colours, and go and run against the RAF and the Navy and the Marines and all the rest of this thing. And I did, I think I was there about a week, and I went down to Akrotiri, RAF Akrotiri, 
and I competed for the army and uh, I got selected. I think I came second or third in the race. I can't remember, but I beat everyone in my unit anyway. And no one even knew who I was. And I got selected to represent the army. And I remember going in front of, um, what was his name? Lieutenant Colonel Baxter went in front of him, the D.O. Major saying, and I got marched in and halt and all that stuff salute. And he went, ah, Ranger Colt, welcome to One Royal Irish. It's great to see you here. Good to see you starting off the right foot. He says, I understand you've just been selected for the army. He says, well, you can sack that. That's not happening. You have to stay here and learn your trade. You're not just coming in the battalion and going off running. You'll stay here and you'll learn your trade. And I was like, that's probably the best thing that anyone said to me. Because if I had went off and did running, I'd have been running and all that stuff. End up like some freak that just runs races with no military experience who didn't talk to the military. So I had to learn my craft, which was probably a good idea. And I spent, uh, went and exercised Pink Flamingo and exercised in, in, in Cyprus, which were, oh, it rained nonstop for three days on exercise. I was pissed right through. You're like, like that is not what they said when I signed up. <laughs> I know. They said it Word. was jet skiing. Yeah. That's it. I mean, we got there. And the weird thing is, we got there, and God rest his soul, uh, there was a guy, it was part of the sort of integration team. I can't remember the name of it. But we got there, and for the first two or three days, we went to the back of the camp, right up beside where they had the big white golf balls, um, as we call them, listening uh, centers. Yeah. And uh, for so for about the first two or three days, we did. We went down under, under Chris McDonald, uh, Went down to Cyprus, went down to the beaches and all, and we did a bit of canoeing. We, we did it for three days. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, he was the first sort of decent guy I met in battalion, and uh, he died a few years ago doing close protection in Iraq, actually, poor guy. But uh, he was the first guy that I met that I actually got on with and really thought he was a decent bloke. Yeah, shame, but there we go. So, so you're there, you start learning your craft, and how yeah. long after that do you get deployed? Like what, and what was that like when they said, hey, listen, you're going over? My first operation was uh, in Northern Ireland, actually, uh, South Armagh. Um, we went from, thing is, they cheated me. Because I went there, I went to uh, Cyprus. I was only there for like nine weeks. And then got flown into Catholic, North Yorkshire for a tour. Because they sent me to Cyprus at my first posting, knowing that we had just spent four years, nine months there. And we only had three <laughs> months left. Before we went to Catrick. I was just and then spent five years in Catrick. Uh did my I think I did my first tour. My first operational tour was nineteen ninety five in South ninety five, ninety six in South Armagh, which was uh an eye opener. It was Is uh, that weird I, was that weird? Because it's like, you know, you never really think I guess certainly most Americans would never think as military patrol in the streets of your own country. Well, you hope that that's never going to happen. Well, no one knew who I was. I mean, uh, we didn't have any badges on our arms. Like today, everyone has to wear badges, don't they? Shamrocks. We had no ba- just green, co- just combats with a helmet on. There was no shamrock on it. And we were patrolling down the streets. And I remember being spat on. And don't, in, uh, where were we? South Armagh. Bestbrook. I remember being spat on uh, by a kid. Just walked up and just spat right in my face. And he went, F off back to your own country. And I was like, wow, is this how we get treated? You know? That's <laughs> unbelievable. They used, to, they used to be in shock, but when I'd go, I am in my own country, you little shitbag. They'd go, huh? They didn't know. But uh, yeah, uh, Bestbrook, all around that area. It's it's, uh, it's one of those things that, yeah, I mean, the, the kids don't even know, do they? I mean, they they, they don't no. know, they don't realize, they're just... They're all conditioned They're just the taught. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're taught. They're taught that. And that's really unfortunate. Yeah, and you know, I used to have it when when I first came here because my my grandfather was from Dundalk, and so he he raised me. I, I've never told you this, I don't think, but he he was the male influence in my life. He's he he lived around the corner, and it was kind of weird because you know he never spoke about any of the troubles that were over in Ireland because he hmm. he'd go north because there wasn't any work down in Dublin when he was there, so he'd have to go up to Belfast and and it was a it, it, it was it was strange, but he never he never said anything about it. And then I think when when we were growing up, I mean, you know, the IRA was very active in London, mm-hmm. as you know. And I was down there in those early years, like I was down in London from 1990 uh, onwards. And I I actually remember going down. It was a Saturday, I believe, 
And, you know, the, the funny thing, people that, again, people that didn't grow up in that era uh, or uh, were mm-hmm. American or are American, all of a sudden overnight, all the trash cans disappeared, right? Like there were no yeah. trash cans. They took all the trash cans away because the bombs were being put in the trash cans. And I remember on a, it was a Saturday and I had to go for a meeting. And I remember going, it was the city of London. We went. I'm sure it was a Saturday. Oh, I might be wrong. If anyone's watching this that can correct me on this, please do. But I remember going down into the subway and hearing this colossal like, <laughs> and that's when they blew up the city of London. And it was just like, I think that it took them like years to reglaze all of the buildings there because all the windows that were blown out. But mm. but oddly enough, when I first came to the States and I, and I, I met some people in Boston, they were like, oh, the troubles, the troubles. And I was like, like you said, actually, most people kind of got on every day. You know, they, yeah. they, they, it wasn't like people, like people kind of made a bigger deal of it over here yeah. than they did back home. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I first left Northern Ireland and traveled to England with the military, I mean, I would just be, no, I didn't go by myself. There was about, I think there was six of us all together from Belfast left at the same time to join the army. And if we were, and I hated this. Today, I would have gotten loads of compensation because that's what people do. People like to claim today. But see, if I was sitting in a bar with these guys, my friends, all soldiers, and we were speaking, having a few beers, and we were talking, we would come out to be met by police who would have us against the wall, searching us. We have to show our ID cards. We're in the military. Oh, we're really, really sorry. I mean, we were stereotyped as, as potential potential terrorist threats, just a yeah. group of guys going for beer and different, well, especially, especially if you're going for a beer in Catrick, which is a military garrison, and they hear your accent, they would panic. Right. It wasn't until they got used to just being there. They're all Irish here, by the way. They're po- There's 500 men around the corner. This is what they talk like. But um, it used to be stereotyped like that all the time. But I do understand why. Better to be safe than sorry in it. But uh, you wouldn't get away with that today, though. Well, I but mean, that's that's part and parcel of it, right? Like it's part and parcel of how soft we've gotten that men would just go, okay, all right. Well, it's part, you know. I remember uh, the same thing with my grandfather when my grandfather, um, the family would go back home. They'd actually tell us when we would go, like, hey, listen, just remember where you are when you go back, and, and we'd be like, yeah, well, you know, they would they would pay a little bit of special treatment. A little bit of special attention to my grandfather when he would come back. And yeah. he was just like, yeah, what do you expect? Like, you know, we're at war. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I do want to ask you about something else. And I want to talk more about your military career. But for the, for the Americans that don't know this, what I couldn't understand, because, you know, I considered going into the military for a while. And then I decided that's really too tough. So what I'll do is I'll just play one on TV a bit. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot less dangerous, Trevor. Um, <laughs> so, Taffy, Paddy, right? Like Jock. The I think in almost every kind of like platoon or whatever, if you had someone that was Welsh, they'd be yep. Taffy, right? Yep. If they were if they were Irish, they'd be Paddy. Yep. Because I remember going out with my friends and did go, oh, that's Paddy there, that's Paddy, that's this, that's that. They, they just immediately said it. Now, uh, do they even allow that in the British Army? Is that like, oh, you can't call someone um, Paddy? That's like ethnically profiling or, or some woke garbage. I think the culture in the military, um, they've tried to quiet it down. But um, the guy, I know a guy called Paddy Reddy. He's a scouser and lives, lives in Liverpool. <laughs> It's just weird, but I mean, he's called Paddy. But um, today, I mean, the guys will still have nicknames for each other. It's just the ones at the top will try and go, oh, that's, you can't say that. What if he hurts his feelings? I think the army is the only place we can get, well, I think the military is the only place we can get away with those nicknames because, and you keep it to yourself. The minute you go outside camp or you go outside to the civilians, it'll have to be first name terms in front of people. You don't want to upset people, but. Back in camps, I think that still happens. It's just the civilian culture is quite weak today. So, they, they but isn't that a way? It isn't that a way? And you know, and and I know that you have a lot of you know, you have brothers in arms over here in the United States. Uh, it, isn't it a part of that? Even the gallows humor. You know, I'll talk about yeah. guys that are in the middle of a firefight and they'll do something stupid, right? Like just 
Yeah. Just, you know, it, because it's it's letting off steam, right? You, you're in extreme environments, and that's just a way that you get to express yourself. And and certainly for me, like, you know, I think we'd only known each other five minutes, and we, we, we're immediately, like, taking the piss out of each other. Um, and, and that's like a, a term of, in, not only is it is like a kind of a, a term of endearment, but it's also a, a stress buster, right? Like, exactly. you, yeah. You, right. Yeah. I mean, if you're offended by words, how am I going to get you to go and run towards enemy fire? How am I going to get you to go and kill that guy? How am I going to attack that position? If me calling you a knobhead is going to, is going to if, if me calling you names is going to stop you from doing your work, then I don't want to work with you. You just go. I'd, I'd rather have a guy who's, you need to be bullet, in a way, I don't mean as in bullets, but you need to be, you need to wear an armor basically in, in the military. And if you want to get on in life and you want to go and achieve your objectives, words can't stop you. Imagine, well, I didn't take the position, Trevor, because the guy called me, called me a patty on the way up there and I just thought I'm not having that. So I just decided to turn around. Uh, I give him a nasty stir and uh, I'm not doing it. I mean, well, the, the, the other thing, the other thing is, Trev, with, with this ridiculousness is what it does is it puts people at risk, right? It, yeah, and, it, and it's, it's real. It's not a game, right? It's not a game when you're up against people that want to kill you. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's plain and simple, right? I mean, they want to kill you. You are in the army. Your yeah. job is to kill other people. That, that's what it is at the end of the day. In the military, it's having, it's that is them. your job. Yeah, it's having the right mindset. Now, you're right. It, it is to kill or be killed. But the thing is, you've got to bear in mind that um, no matter where you're working in the military, now, we're not talking about back in England. Back in England, where it's quite calm and relaxed, we're talking about operations. When, when, we, go, when we travel abroad as a unit to do a certain operation, even then, um, and I do believe this still happens, but prior to leaving camp, prior to leaving those gates of your FOB, your forward operation base, whatever, before to those gates, you will go in with your guys probably the command, if you can fit everyone into it, but if you can't, the commanders, they will all go in and they will get an intelligence brief. And you will find out what the threat is that day on the ground. The area you're going to, what the threat is. So I'll go in, I'll sit down, I'll have me, uh, my ant guy will be there, my ants and debts will be there, attachments and detachments for my patrol. And we'll sit and we'll go through, okay, what assets do we have before we leave camp? We've got UAV, Predator, we've got, we've got okay, we've got our assets, okay, them up. plus we've got uh, top cover, maybe Apache. I would go out on a patrol and I would feel really warm and fuzzy. And, yeah, this is, this is going to be an easy patrol if I knew it was being flown by Predator or UAV or something, which is giving a live feedback to the option what's on that ground. So I knew exactly what was happening on the ground in front of me as I was moving forward. But I'd also get an in brief of what is the threat today? Oh, it's, it, is it booby trap? Is, is, it, is the threat IED? Is the threat suicide born? Is it vest? Is it, so is it going to be a shoot, a sniper? And you know exactly what the threat is in that area before leaving camp. So... I always like to know what was on the ground. So then it's okay, uh, killer be killer be killed, but it depended on what the patrol was. There's no such thing as a buck sheep patrol because you're going out into the area where the enemy are. So all patrols, if you go out with the right mindset, knowing the threats could be A, B, C, or D, and you keep your you keep your wits about you and you're focusing on your guys, making sure moving in, making sure we're moving with the right spacing so we're inside the ECM bubble, making sure we're moving around. If you have the right mindset and everyone is switched on, which they normally are, most patrols went off without a hitch. It was whenever you would, for instance, I had a guy, I uh, won't mention his name, who I took on patrol. Uh, he came straight from training in Catrick, came straight out to Sangin and uh, thrown into my platoon. He's a nice guy, but he was out patrolling in front of me and um, he was out patrolling in front of me and I noticed that the, he just went down, boom, hit the deck, and I was like, I got everyone to go firm. What's happened? What's happened to him? I thought he'd been hit. I thought he'd been hit, and I panicked. And I went there. Uh, <laughs> I ran up to him, and I said, are you okay? And he went, I don't know. I don't know, Sergeant. I don't know. And I went, what's up? I said, how you drinking fluids? Mate, he had his camel pack on his back, with like three liters on it, and he still had the plastic coating over the, over the end. And he, he collapsed with dehydration. But, you know, simple things like that. He was straight from training, and in a way, I think probably my fault between sword. We should have we should have mothered him a little bit more to find out 
and sometimes you sometimes you sort of think these are such simple jobs he should be able to know this himself but unless you get these guys in that are Hickey was 30, 30 years of age at the time but you still need to you still need to well you've also you, you you've also got other yeah, when, other things on your mind right it's not like you, you're um yeah you know you you, you have other priorities when you're going out. so so let, let's just go back a little bit to when you first got deployed yep overseas like not to the you. you know to, to the to the to a combat zone can you tell me about how you how that came down and what happened right uh When I went to work in Baghdad uh, as protection for um, three-star General Nicholas Houghton, um, I enjoyed that. Our job was to escort him around Baghdad safely so he could go through all those meetings. Um, I, started, I got involved in, a, in a, an incident on Route Irish, famous Route Irish. Got an incident mm -hmm. there where I was doing rear top cover. And that's the day that I, that's the day I got awarded the military cross, but I didn't. I didn't do anything special. I mean, I've spoken this many a time. There's loads of rumors out there what I did, what I did. And I, see, whenever rumors start going around, I'll explain what happened on that day. And then I'll tell you the rumors. I now just agree with rumors. I've got the stage where I'm just sick of, sick of going no. So basically, uh, we were out and we were taking a drops wagon to collect vehicles. Uh, in I think the camp was called Camp Victory, an American camp. I can't remember. But we had to go out of uh, BSU, by that support unit, drive down Road Irish, which is the red zone. And on the way down there, um, the atmospherics were all wrong. If it makes sense, the atmospherics were all wrong. And we, um, there was a, a car parked the side of the road, and we noticed it. A white, a white, I think it was a white Toyota, a white Nissan. Don't matter. Sitting this below a bridge, and we were going, and we noticed it. It was just weird. It was just a weird. There was no vehicle. There's usually loads of vehicles on the road, but this day was just the one, and no vehicles on the road. We went in. And we we, I think we got a new drops or a drops wagon, which is a big. British wagon. I think we were changing vehicles around or something. I can't remember the exact task, if I'm honest. But uh, on the way out, we, we did all our checks. We headed back up the road. I'm in the rear snatch vehicle with the rear vehicle anyway. And my arcs, I think my arcs were something like uh, 12 to 6. So I was looking out sort of the right-hand side of the vehicle. Uh, it wasn't my job to look the other way. It sounds weird. It's not. That was the other guy's job. And we, we, we were heading down. And I remember the radio going a bit mad. Everyone was screaming the radio. And they were trying to, so the, our vehicles were like staggered across the road, covering all the angles. And I remember at the start, uh, I seen, I just looked at the front, I seen what's going on. Okay, there's a vehicle below that bridge. And they were shouting all the warning signs to stop this vehicle. But it started driving, it started reversing back towards the convoy. And it was it was all wrong. And I remember uh, it's it sped up a little bit. And I think the guy at the front fired a couple of rounds at the vehicle to deal with it. But I still wasn't getting drawn in. I was just ignoring it. It's not my job. I'm at the back. My job is to look after the rear. And then I remember looking out and seeing a couple of guys running from the, known as the uncleared flats. And they started setting up a gun. And they started engaging at the side of the vehicles. And I got, I was on my, my radio anyway, and I, I, was, I was seeing what was happening. And I got my driver, OD, great driver. Uh, I worked with him in Afghan as well. Great guy. I remember saying, saying, shouting down and asking him to uh, move the move our vehicle around to the right and drive it alongside the other guy's wagon because one of the vehicles had broken down. It tried to go from the central central reservations in Baghdad. I mean, they're about a foot and a half. It's not it's not a small curb, and you had to push the vehicles over to get it over. And I remember we were at the side just to deflect the rounds, just to take us, just to get them in cover. And I just engaged. I just engaged the the. The guys on the ground. That's all I did. I engaged the guys on the ground. Uh, dealt with the threat. That's it. Dealt with the threat. Came back into camp. Uh, we went back into the American camp to sort of write down notes what, what we'd all done and all that. So how many rounds were all fired. And then when we got back into BSU, we drove back that day in the Baghdad support unit. Um, Alan Somerville, who was the sergeant major, and Morfu, can't remember his first name. He was a major anyway, the company commander. Had everyone in one at a time to give their what they had seen come in and give your statement and it was all written down and i just went in and he said uh people were in before me and i just remember how many rounds how many rounds did you fire i fired a mag and a half i'm like 45 rounds wow 
I fired a mag, I fired half a mag, and it, it went all around. And I went in and he goes, uh, okay, uh, Corporal Colt, um, tell me what happened. I, I explained that to him. How many rounds did you fire? And I went, 12. Oh, why? I said, well, this was happening as they were moving. I was firing. The vehicle was moving. It's hard to hit somebody when your vehicle is moving. So you're trying to fire from a moving vehicle. It's, it's really, I know it looks great in the movies, but I tell you what, it's really yeah, I've hard. Done, I've done it. I've done it. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. It's hard to hit a target. Yeah. I know. I had to get the, the side of the wagon, the, the bits that fall down on the top cover, like perspex. You have to get your weapon right in and pull it back to keep it stable just to get a shot which is going to go in the direction of it and that's how i fired you can't just fire like that you've got to get it you've got to get right tucked in to get it tight and i remember uh coming at 12 rounds why did you fire 12 rounds uh but because of this target and this target and this target okay why did you only fire 12 rounds i says because there was no longer a threat okay and um do you think it was justified and i went yeah and i justified every round that i fired and that was it thought nothing of it then um, went back down to the company, uh, explained what happened in Baghdad, how they patrolled. The company I was with in Baghdad, support company, I mean, great commanders. They were they, Their patrolling skills were great. I, learned, I actually learned a lot from them, quite good. And I sort of adapted some of their stuff they were doing and implemented it with my guys. But uh, that was my first really engagement with anything. But to me, it didn't feel like a threat because it seems weird. It was surreal, but I didn't feel in danger because I had so many men around me doing their job um, my first my first real threat uh which was i think i think sang in afghanistan that was scary shit uh but yeah i mean so tell me about that tell me about when you when you went to over to sangin which is I, I just want to point out if you can reach behind you and get that book so people can go and get it if they um if they should so choose. Well, yeah. Well, I wrote this book is based on just my notebooks and what happened in Afghanistan. Sorry, yeah. And I, but um, I enjoyed Afghan. I I deployed in Herring Four with three uh, three para C company, and looking back at it now, looking how the armies moved, I don't think another another unit could have done that as well as three para did. I I don't I don't think there's any other unit. Not even Royal Irish Battalion could have done that as well as they did, uh, the unit I was in. But the, I was so lucky to have guys that weren't just robust. You had guys that were professional, but they were also lunatics, mate. And those guys, would, they're the guys you want at your left and right. They don't care. They're like, we've got your back. Have you got our back? Yep, we've got your back. And they just go for it. And the guys, I mean, they succeeded. Okay, they lost guys. Of course they did. And the reason why they lost guys... It's because they were right at the enemy's door, kicking it in, blowing holes through compound walls, attacking the enemy. That's what happens, and uh, I think that was brilliant. But yeah, um, that was an eye opener. That tour. Uh, I mean, there's, there's. I've dealt with this now, but uh, there was a bit of that tour broke me. I mean, there's nothing better than than flying in and your chinooks, three chinooks in the air, and you're, you're flying into battle. You see the red and green trace in the air. The enemy's trying to hit you. You're landing on a hot LZ. You're getting off you're under enemy fire, and and you're going right in the battle. I mean, the hurt to back of your neck stand up. The adrenaline's pumping, and you are all like, I mean, it, it was just amazing. It's just a shame that we had a guy shot on the helicopter before we not not on our heli, but on the other Chinook. As we were flying in the battle, the enemy hit that chopper. They took a casualty in the air. That's how that's how tough the Taliban were. Um, if I'm honest, I wouldn't put them down. Uh, they're scum, but I tell you what. They were very professional, and they were a proper fighting unit. But then again, so were we. So, it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I came back broken from that one, but I, I just focused on the next tour. I just wanted to focus. But I mean, can you tell me a little bit about that, Trev? About when you first and the difference it was from Iraq. Like, what was the culture shock for you when you when you go over there? You, you touch down in Afghanistan. You've heard about it, right? You know what's going on. Iraq's clinical. I mean, Iraq had proper camps, you know, cook houses, cook houses. You queued up and you could get your, you could get your Gatorade and your Fanta and your Coke. You get a sausage roll, go to the burger stand, go to the pasta stand, the pizza stand. Iraq was easy. It was easy. Um, Afghan, you landed there, there was green tents. There was nothing. 
you had your rations, you went straight into battle. There was no, there was no messing around, straight into battle. Um, and it's a, it's, it's everything. It, it's hard. Exp everything you've trained for, you go through training and you're taught how to. You're lying out on an ambush. You're doing a. Uh, you're learning how to do a dog leg. You're learning how to move from point to point, waypoint to waypoint, section attack, platoon attacks, mortars, calling in mortars. I mean, you're sitting in a built-up place which reminds you of a biblical, biblical. I mean, the buildings are, there's no glass. I mean, there's no, there's no windows. It's all just, you know, sand, mud huts everywhere and singing. And um, you're calling in. You're calling in fire from, from, from Apaches. You're calling in fire from jets. I mean, you're getting QRF to come in. You're, you're getting all the platoons to come in. You're, you're, you're dropping bombs and mortars on enemy. I mean, you're, it's just, it's exact. It's We Were Soldiers, the Mel Gibson movie, but for real. And it's, it, you, once, once you've been there and you come back and, and you have all these emotions in one day, I mean, one day you're getting up, you're having your brief, you're speaking to your guys. I mean, the next day, one of the guys you spoke to at breakfast time has now been killed. And I mean, that's it's it's something that it, I struggle with to deal with. But uh, my as a commander, my two IC uh, died beside me. You know, with the motorman off, and it took part of his head off. And I remember looking down at him and just there's nothing you can do. But uh, that lives with you. I mean, that's that's there every day, and um, I struggle to deal with that. Imagine coming back in from from an operation to sit outside a to sit in a wooden bench to grab a cup of cup of coffee, and people going, "Ah, where's Luke today?" And you're like, "He he he died yesterday." I mean, gone. That's him gone. I mean, some of the some of the things you get to see, you should never have to see. Um, as a platoon sergeant. Working with two para, two thousand eight. Again, I loved it. I loved the I loved the operations. I remember um, my platoon always got a good name. Uh, I was robust and strict, but also I knew when to take his foot off the guys, let the guys relax because they're under extreme pressure. There's, there's there's no other job in the world, mate. Where you send two guys out to walk in front of your platoon to take a blast, go and search for IEDs. So. It's, Go and make sure that's safe to the risk. I mean, I take my hat off to all, all those guys, you know, the guys, uh, the search guys at the front of every patrol, every patrol of every unit that has to make that route safe for the rest of the guys. I mean, that is, that's probably the most stressful job in the world. And uh, there's no other job like that. I mean, a platoon sergeant, okay, uh, I think many people can do platoon sergeant. Well, many people with common sense can do it. To be told, and even guys volunteering, I was like, wow, okay. Um, I remember I had a, I, I think you probably met, Dave, or, no, you've spoke about Dave Hayhoe, whose dog. Um, yeah. I know, I've, got I know here. I've got it here somewhere. Trio. I've got, where's Trio? There's it there. Sorry. My good friend, Dave Hayhoe. That's his book. Who's his? That dog won the Dickens Medal, which is the equivalent of the Victoria Cross. So, uh, trio was out in our patrols, and uh, you've got to remember that whenever you have dogs in your patrol, uh, proper, really great dogs, you've got to remember that those dogs need time to relax as well. It's a hot day; the handler needs time to let the dogs have a rest and a drink. We were out one day on a patrol, and um, the day before. We'd searched it. Trio had found about five or six IEDs, you know, and every time he finds them, we have to go firm. IED him, we'd called out to clear it. And he found loads on, this was our patrol out that day. We, we got out, the dog was tired. We were knackered. We lay up uh, in a compound that we searched. And then the next day we made our way back into camp. We made our way back the same path, which the dog had already searched. We'd already found IEDs. And an IED went off. The Taliban had already re-dug in an IED. But they dug it deep. It was done by, um, I think it was pressure pad, rather than, rather than, anyway, the, the way it worked was that it went off. And I was at the back of the platoon. 
between Sorensen at the back, he counts his men back out. And I was, and I just, I just seen this big black puff of smoke. And then I heard the bang. And I just, I mean, my heart sank. I went, fuck. And I heard the radio go mad in my ear. And I started, my heart started going really fast. I said, fuck. And I just ran. I just ran with my medic. She was behind me. And I ran all the way to the front. And when I got there, it was carnage. I seen about five or six blokes just lying all over the place. And my, sorry, my interpreter, he's only about five foot two, but he was called The Rock. He liked Dwayne Johnson. He called himself The Rock. And I think that was my last patrol, actually, because we, we were getting ready to hand over to the Royal Marines. I think it might be four two. And I looked down at The Rock and his nose had been blown off. He had no nose. Um, he only he do, he only had small, he, he only had Thumbs and the baby fingers. He had lost six fingers. Uh, because he was carrying a rec he, he was recording the patrol. Now, I don't know if I saved him or I caused the damage, but I remember heading out and I was thinking of a way that I wanted to record our patrol so that whenever we came back in that night, we could show the Marines on my laptop and on their stuff how we did our spacing, our patrolling. I wanted to teach the commanders. It's just what you did for each other. So he was kind of, he says, can I carry the recorder? Can I carry it? I said, if you want. So he was just carrying it like this, and he was recording the patrol. And when the IED went off, he lost his fingers, and the camera recorder took part of his face off. He may have got that blast in the face had he not been carrying something to protect them. But um, I looked down at him, and he was screaming and screaming and screaming. And my initial reaction was, fuck him. Now, that may sound callous, but I just went, he's screaming? He's okay. It's the ones that aren't screaming was my initial thought. So... Um, I got up there and I seen him. He was screaming. I looked down at him. I could see his legs were there, his arms were there, his missing fingers. He, we can deal with that, right? I looked down and I seen uh, my radio up. Uh, American guy actually called Justin Couples. He transferred into us from the U.S. Navy, and he, he was uh, he was my radio up. I mean, he was my linguist. He could speak Pashtun. And I looked down at him, and he was missing an arm and a leg, and um, one side and whole back blown out. And I was like, medic, deal, deal with this. I got a team medic to go over to the, the rock and just, I, I don't know why I did this, but I just went over. And I st we started working on him first aid. And I just said to him, shut the fuck up. Shut it. And I just, shut And he, 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 then he, he put his hand on his nose and he stopped screaming. I just, just shut up. Let's get, let, there, there's, and I looked over and there was another guy who had shot my wounds and stuff. So the dog had went, um, the great, our great dog uh, had went uh, really, really quiet. It was like carrying away. Th that that blast broke the dog, unfortunately. But that dog saved dozens of lives. Um, yeah, I, I remember looking down and seeing it. And I don't know why I did this, uh, but there's a lot of things going through your mind. Whenever something like that happens, you're looking, right, first of all, you're looking for casualties. What are they T1s, T2s, T3s, T4s, T4, meaning dead? Are they T3s? Are they priority? You then have to start and you have to start prioritizing. You're having to do this as a platoon sergeant. You're prioritizing your casualties. You're sending a contact report. You're sending a missed report, a nine liner, a missed report, um, nine liners that you, you're, you're asking for a QRF to come out. You're asking for top cover. You're, you're searcher, shot rep. You need, there's all these things going through your head that you need to get on the radio. And, and then on top of all that, I looked down and I seen um, his arm and I noticed it was his left arm going, his left leg. And for some reason, I um, I asked one of the guys with one of the pieces of search equipment, I says, can you just check the area around here? Um, and he said, well, I, says, We're, I, just, I want to see if we can find, I don't know why, but I want his wedding ring. I want to be able to take his wedding ring back to give it to his wife. You know, all these things going through your head, you're trying to... And, and then you've got to keep an eye on your blokes. Make sure they're not falling apart. Make sure they're still doing a job. Make sure they're watching the rock. Make sure they're doing this. Make sure the kids. And then you've all this going on. You've got to write reports, you get a statement, and SIB, searchers. Um, there's about 15 things going through your head at that one time. And it's ex it's, 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 it's extreme pressure that I've never felt before. Plus, what, is the, what, what, is the, what are the chances that they do a hit like that and then they follow up? Like, because because surely you're not only thinking about I have to get in here and I have to save these guys or whoever can be saved, but you're also looking 
right to say, well, are they going to hit us a second time? The truth is, when, when, whenever something that happens and, and they know they've hit you, they know when they've hit you, they're off celebrating. They don't give a shit. Really? They're not going to come back because they know now that area is swamp. You've got an Apache in the air. You've got an Apache in the air with the, with the cannons. I mean, with the Hellfires. You've got more troops coming out. QRF's coming out. Uh, Kazibak plans now in place. I mean, there's now a ring of steel around, around that incident. So it's very rare that they would come out and try and hit you again at that. Um, I know that sometimes in, in movies it, uh, it shows you where as they go out to the area, the, the, like some of the movies are perfect where the ICP, the engine control point, is set maybe 50 metres away from the main contact area and they do it from there. And sometimes in the movies it shows you, well, in the, they've already worked out where the ICP is and there'll be a secondary device there. Um mm-hmm. It, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It used to happen in North, it used to happen in Northern Ireland all the time. The IRA were very good. Uh, but then again, most of them went to Sandhurst. Um, but the in Afghan, the Taliban hit you. They knew they'd hit you, and it's just they left you alone. They didn't. I mean, there was times. Was that the same in where, Iraq as well? Was that the same in Iraq? Would, would um, they do the same, or was it different Iraq, because it's an urban combat? Right, it's more of a Iraq was not conven- I mean, Afghan was like more conventional warfare. I mean, in in um. In Iraq, it was more like an urban environment that hit you from buildings and things. Where in, in Afghan, they'd hit you from out in the water. I mean, they hit you from all angles. At one stage in in, uh, in Sang in DC, we got hit from about five locations at the same time to see how we would react. They were very good. Um, yeah. Were they? The Taliban, uh, what, what was the? Were they trained by the Iranians or yeah? Who were they trained by to be so good? Because Taliban. I know that yeah, the Taliban um, like. We got to remember that Taliban's original was the um, Mujahideen. Mujahideen were taught yeah. by American forces and British forces. Quite a lot of them went to Sandhurst and knew our knew they knew our tactical scenarios. They knew how we they had our path. In fact, I'm sure that the the leaders of of, of uh, Taliban who were originally Mujahideen probably had all our had all our pamphlets and training doctrine. I'm sure, I'm sure they had it all. I mean, they did go to Sandhurst. We did teach them. The Americans taught them at West Point Mujahideen. We taught them at Sandhurst. Years and years later, we're fighting people that know our tactics. I mean, imagine going out on the ground and being hit hit by a Taliban sniper, and we're trained to go into the nearest ditch. In that nearest ditch is an IED. They were brilliant. They were tactical experts on the ground. We had to sort of second second think our own thoughts on the ground. So, uh, that's not even proper. That's not, we had to second think or second guess where they thought we were going to go to and then go somewhere. I mean, it was just strange. I mean... It was great learning. It was probably the best learning experience I've had in combat. Uh, but um, And how do you it's... feel, Trev? Trev let, sorry, let me ask you this. How do you feel? You've just seen there, you've seen your brothers get hit. Are you just like, you know, you have the initial shock, right? And I'm sure a lot of mourning. Mm. But then you go, all right, I want to I wanna get out there and I want to get him. Like, I want to go and I want to. I want to get the guys that did this. Do you feel like that? Or are you just like, because I know some people uh, look at, look at it as like, okay, well, this is the, this is what we do. This is what they do. Right. It's, it's the job. Right. Do you see what, you know, did it become more personal for you whenever you lost someone? I know that might sound like a a Um, ridiculous conversation or a ridiculous question. You have a thing which is known in the military as the red mist. When the red mist comes across and you just focus on killing rather than doing your job, you do get minutes. It come, the red mist is there and you, you, you want to go, you want to kill. Um, but no, no. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, in hindsight, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I wish I'd have killed everyone I came across. I really do. I wish I'd have killed every single one of them twice. But uh, I couldn't do it at the time because you're, you, we didn't know what was happening. Now, I went back again for another operational tour after that last one. And I went out and I worked with the Intelligent Exploitation Force. So it was our job to fly out in the late at night and pick up high-value Al-Qaeda and Taliban uh, detainees and bring them back for, uh, let's be honest, interrogation. 
we're not allowed to use the word interrogation, but I'll use it here. Uh, we used to, we changed that word for woke people, and we ch we we said we will not interrogate anyone anymore. But what we will do is we'll exploit them. So we're going to, have to exploit people. It's the same thing, different wording. It's a lot nicer, isn't it? So we used to bring it back in for exploitation, and we'd go through, and uh, it was quite sad. I had I have known what I witnessed on my last tour in Afghan, if I'd known that for the first two tours, um, orders should have been kill everyone on site. Should have been for everyone. Because what was happening that... is, sorry, go on, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What we were doing is troops on the ground. We we would get involved in battles, and if we if we caught a high value target, a high commander Taliban or Al Qaeda, we thought it was fantastic. We would we would bring them, cuff them, blind, bring them in, hand them over, hand them over to the British. They're going to jail. No, the reality is uh, working on the exploitation side of things. Um, they were coming in. We were taking off all their clothes for DNA and forensics. We were giving them brand new dispatch trousers, prayer hats, prayer beads. We were feeding them. We were looking after them. We were exploiting them. They were getting. We were trying to get information from them. But at the same time, their clothes were going away. We were getting hits on those clothes. We were getting hits on their hands and their arse, everything. These guys had touched IEDs, which had killed British and American coalition troops. We had them. We knew these were the guys. They should have went to jail. But what was happening is we were taking them to Lash Nagar and we were handing them over to the Afghan judicial sort of side of things. And the Afghan courts don't recognise DNA or, or forensics. So they were being released back on the battlefield and they were going back out to kill more troops. So had you have told um, the British troops or from the start, it doesn't matter what you do here, when you bring them back, if we bring them back in for helicopter ride and fresh meals, they'll be out within 14 days. And now... You have these stories going around about special forces killing people, and I, I don't care. I don't care. I mean, they were the only ones that went out to actually uh, remove evil off, off our planet, uh, whether it was British, American, Australian, New Zealand, whether it was um, the Estonians or the Dutch, I mean, or the Canadians, should I say. We need special forces. We need robust men that are willing to go and remove evil from our planet. We need those type of men to make the world safe. And right now all I see is right now all I see is governments failing to protect the very men that keep us safe by trying to prosecute them. I mean it's just shocking. Um I I you know I mentioned this before to uh, a well known journalist in the UK called Mark Urban. Uh, I did a thing on Spotlight BBC and I said I, I, I seen it with my own eyes. I mean I seen these guys being released back on the battlefield and we used to pay them I mean, I, I got about five trips where I would take these guys. I'd make sure no one was watching first thing in the morning. Usually around about nine, between nine and 12. They'd be blindfolded. They'd have their little cuffs on in the back of the vehicle with me. <coughs> the vehicle had blacked out windows so no one could see in. We would drive to the main gate, then go forward about 50 metres so no one could see. I would get the Taliban commanders out. I would cut their cuffs off, plastic cuffs off take off their blindfold and have an interpreter with me. I'd have a pistol on my side and then I would have to read out this bullshit about thank you for your cooperation with, uh, I don't know, UK, UK forces. Um, thank you for all the information that you've given us. We now wish you and your family uh, good health and here's some money for your trouble. And we'd pay these fuckers money, sorry. And we'd give them, I did it, hand them money. And they'd walk down the road and they're dish dash smiling and all. They were going back on the battlefield to fight us. Two weeks later, I mean, that is the it's, worst. It's not, it's a, Trev. It's not like demotivating for them because you know what you want to do is you want to destroy them. You want them to be afraid of you, and and really what they're doing is like, hey, listen, if they capture us, then we're going to get two weeks in, you know, Food. Club UK, uh, and a payoff like bonus. Like I hope they catch me. I mean, well, I, I'm, you know, um, I I used to have to do these as well. So when I worked in the um, I wasn't allowed to use this word in the past in the military, but I worked in a place, uh, a place called Torchlight, right? And um, every two weeks, the Taliban were allowed to have Zoom calls with their family. Not a single British soldier, Christian force, was allowed to do a Zoom call in Afghanistan with their family. It was against the regulations, against the security measures. Taliban did it. Every two weeks, they would go into a room, uh, they would sit there and they would they have the camera on, um, and their families would be in Lashnagar at the ICRC, International Committee of Yeah, the ICRC. 
So the ICRC would bring in Taliban families and they would go live and they would speak to their dads or husbands that were in our facility. And they would chat to them on the Zoom call. And they were chatting by themselves, but beside, beside the Taliban guy to the left or to the right was an interpreter interpreting everything so I would know what was being said. And I remember the interpreter, this is true, man. I remember the interpreter laughing and the Taliban guy just laughed, just laughing. He said something to his family and burst out laughing. The interpreter couldn't stop laughing. And I'm like, what is it? What is it? What is it? What's he said? And I, I froze it. I froze the screen. I said, what's he said? He said to his family, you're not going to believe this. He says, four meals a day. He says, they're going to teach us English soon. I've got all fresh clothes. I've got a new prayer mat. I've got a new Quran. He said, they're really, really good. We get, we get green tea. We get green tea every couple of hours. But why don't you get the rest of the family to go and shoot at the British and get them in here? That's what he told his family. I mean, why wouldn't you? And, and this is the, the thing which I want to get to next is our own veterans do not get treated as well as they did. It is no. ridiculous. That Sorry. something needs to change, right? I mean, I don't think again. I think that when you when you know, there's a lot of people out there that are like, you know, they talk about oh, who the best unit is and mm. and who this where the strongest army is and and all those you know all those kind of things you see on YouTube. But the truth of the matter is, if the British and American militaries took the gloves off, they would have finished that within a week. Like that, Easy, that easily. whole thing would have been over. And the political. problem is, and, and but like you say, the, the problem is, is that they know our rules of engagement, right? Yeah. And so if I'm in, you know, the SAS or I'm a Delta guy, I'm going to, yeah, you know, I'm going to take care of business because I want to go home. I mean, exactly. we, we are, we, we are, the, you don't go to war unless you're going to go and kill the people that you're going after, right? Like, and give, yeah. give our guys every means that they need to achieve their objective. It is utterly absurd and something really needs to change it needs well, to change from 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 top to bottom and we, we we got the you know america right now is a joke i mean I, I, my you know you know my uh my one of my sons always wanted to join west point and right. um you know because i have a bunch of friends that that went there and now he's like, no, there's no way. There's no way I'm joining the military. And actually, all the people that I know that went to West Point and are very, very proud of that, you know, and they're very, very proud of the time they served in the military, they all said, please do not send your son into the military right now. It's, it's, we're not having people, this isn't, like I said, it's not a country club. It's not a social experiment. These are people that are going into harm's way, right? And you need hard men and hard women to go out and do that. And yeah. you need to give them everything they need to achieve it so they can come home alive. Right. I, I, you know, well, it, yeah. it, it's not, it's not fair. And I've actually on, on one of my upcoming podcasts, Trevor, you know, a mutual friend of ours, a, a gentleman that I introduced you to Frank, he's going to come on and talk about this because, because he Brilliant. was involved, you know, he went to West Point and yeah. uh, he was also involved in multiple different operations uh, abroad. Well, Fra Frank will tell you, mate, that, um, and I speak, I, I don't speak for everyone as, we, as I keep getting told. You don't speak for me. But listen, the men are still robust. The training hasn't changed. I mean, we still, we still have units that, that could destroy our enemy. We have still got some of the most robust, steady eye killers in the world. We have professionalism. We've got guys that, that can do all this. They're there. The problem we have is the politics behind it. So, a lot of colonels and generals and whatever they are at the higher ranks are scared to overstep the line because today, sacked, gone, sacked, gone. Nobody wants to be sacked. Nobody wants to go back and be sacked. So, but who's <laughs> making these decisions, Trev? The, this is the thing that I don't understand. Like, who you, you know, you you have. Look, I'm a big believer in hiring correctly, right? Like, if yeah. you hire smartly, whether it's you know in in the film industry, whether you hire the right actor you hire the right dp whatever it might be you hire the right person for the job yeah and if the job is war you want someone that is going to get the job done otherwise don't do it like you've got to have a desire to and, and look for if you look at something like and, and I, I know people i've got a flag up here of um 
it was on the Al Baghdadi raid, and so I know I know a bunch of people that were involved when Trump came in and he take he took on ISIS, and he just said to the guys, "Go and get the job done," and he gave them all the assets that they need. And guess what? One of the most evil regimes in the history of the world was taken care of in a matter of months, and that is with watching collateral damage as well. So you need to get the right people in place. So tell me, Trevor, from the time you went in to the time you left, which was I don't know how long it was you were in there. What was what changed? Politics. Politics changed. Um, right. I don't know about the US. You'll have your own opinion about the US. But for the UK, in my opinion, in the UK, it all changed with... Um, it all changed with putting together a European army. A European army, uh, the European defence. So... In order for us to put that, we pulled it. We had Brexit. We left the European Union. We wanted our own way of doing things. Uh, we still fall under a lot of the EU laws. So a lot of our laws are made by Europe. And they hold a lot of things against the UK. Uh, but we've had so much buyers with the European Union and with this EU defence that now we stopped, we stopped investing in NATO and we started investing in, I know people don't realize this, but we started investing in the European defense uh, in order to bolster that up. Uh, I can see in the next five, 10 years, European defense, a unity of a European army is going to supersede NATO. NATO is going to be a thing of the past. So we ended up having to fall into line with their policies and their procedures. We ended up downscaling the British army, getting rid of units, getting rid of people. And, uh, disbanding units and then saying we didn't have enough people and then we needed to work with the EU and a lot. So we've seen a lot falling apart and a lot of politicians are scared to go up against Macron and, and it, it, it used to be uh, that lady, I can't remember her name, but it doesn't matter. Um, you've now got, uh, Merkel, Bath, but, Merkel, Merkel in Germany. Uh, there, yeah. yeah there's, so I don't know what's happened. For, for some reason, I can't, two countries that were defeated, France and Germany, now seem to control Europe and they hate well, I know, the I know why that is. I know why that is. They hit us. They they hit the English. They hit the British. Um, well, they, they 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 always have. But uh, you know, part of it is this ridiculous guilt that yeah. Brits have, which I say we shouldn't be guilty for anything. You know, there, there's a lot of really good things. Same with the, the United States, right? Like that. This, this guilt is ridiculous because uh, you know any kind of. Of course, you need to look at the crimes that that anyone might do in their history. Yeah. But, you know, in the same way of here, I think the idea of reparations and all that is just absolutely absurd, you know, yeah. because that, well, that it wasn't me. Ruined it. But, yeah, huh? that, that's ruined the British Army. I mean, I think you've seen some of the stories. In, let's just go just the last year. Um, the Royal Air Force refusing to recruit white males. They only wanted to recruit people for diversity rather than pick. I don't understand this. Surely you should be picking the people with the most experience. The person who had the most er I mean, er miles. The the guys that have more time, the guys that have been involved, who've been flying for years. It shouldn't go about colour or creed, but diversity that's one of the boxes now well, to join the army. And the other thing is is I always say it's like the bigotry of low expectations, right? Because at the end of the day, you want the best person for the job. And it, yeah. It's the same thing when it comes to being a doctor, right? Like, I don't care what kind of a man or woman, like whether my whether my my heart surgeon, if ever I had a you know heart surgery, I don't care about their personal life. I, you know, none of that yeah. bothers me. All I care about is can you do a job, right? Can you do the job to the best of your ability? And yeah. again. It's okay. I mean, you're seeing it now in Hollywood, right? That there's that they've done this um, diversity and inclusion. And look, I'm all for uh, other groups getting at least equal representation of their percentage of, of of the population, whatever it might be. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's certainly, I mean, listen, I didn't moan for years about the fact that you know the villains in all Hollywood movies are English, right? So they're mainly that. I was just very grateful that the fact that we could get work. Right? But but the truth of the matter is, is now we're in a situation where there's there's almost been, well, there has been an overcorrection where I know people certainly that are not white that are like, hang on a minute, did I deserve this? Uh, is this just like, because look, 
I'm not going to give you a job just because of your color. I don't give a damn. Like that is something that is the least most interesting part about a person. It, uh, you know, are the immutable ca characteristics of an individual. I am not interested in that whatsoever. I'm interested in the character and the competency of the person that's doing the job. Yeah. That's it. If you're flying a $30 million or whatever it is plane, you should be the best person, right? Because there's nothing that is more valuable and more precious than someone's life, right? That is the, the most precious thing. And so if you're going to go, for example, one of the things, and I know, Trev, you can talk to this as well. When I have, I have SEAL team members, friends of mine, and they say, you know, once you go through BUDS, however brutal it is, you know if that guy has that trident that the guy next to him has done exactly the same as he has. And there is a level of competency that he knows. And if you start dropping that, you start dropping the requirements, then there's a whole host of other issues that come from that, right? Do, do I rely on that guy anymore? Is he got my six when I'm moving forward? Like you, you spoke about that with the paras, right? You know they're going to take care of business, right? Mm -hmm. They've been through P company. They've done all their jumps. They've done whatever they've got to do. And once they get that beret on, it's on, right? So. The, the, this ridiculousness doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the minorities that want to do better because now people look and they go, diversity higher. It doesn't matter whether or not they are, right? Because that's what people think now. Even, even if they don't say it, that's what they think, and it's completely unfortunate. Sorry, sorry going on, a, on a, a little bit of a rant about this, but we're putting people's lives in danger because of this and it, it yeah. needs to change and there's nothing wrong with with saying i don't care about your color i don't it's not it's not important to me what is important is who you are and what you what you're capable of doing right yeah 100% 100% i mean I, you can be a ginger and get the the um military cross who would have thought it listen for a ginger, I know, why did I always get sent to hot climates where I would go pink and red? I never, ever get sent to a cold climate. Scotland, maybe, but that's it. Were, were you like, hey, listen, I, I should really be doing like Arctic warfare like the Royal Marines? No, they send you to Sangin, <laughs> where you're well, in Iraq. And, you, know. you can get, well, the thing is, I've had heat burn and snow burn. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> So, oh. so um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's ridiculous. And, and uh, I've said this about the border over here as well, just segueing to something else, is that, yeah. is that there's a lot of fighting age males, and I'm sure you know this as well in the UK. We're seeing them come up by the boatload, literally, into the, into the United Kingdom. The, it's not racist to say, hey, listen, we should really be watching who is coming in and out of our country. Right, like I said, when, when my grandfather went over to Ireland, they gave him a little bit of special treatment back in the day. Right. And and he was like, Okay, we're at war. Right, I know we're at war. Like England and, and Ireland are uh, you know, mm. they're at war, the IRA. Isn't it war. crazy though that isn't it crazy though that um if me and you want to come into England I, isn't it we go through passport control, we're scanned, Irish scanned now, fingerprints for us to enter our own country. And that these people are arriving on the shores and dinghies and just going through the hotels. Well, do you know, Nothing. you know, it's it's a funny thing. I, I'm, it's got to be well, it's got to be twenty years ago now because I've been married nineteen years this year. So, twenty years ago, I was flying back in from the United States with my now wife, and but we hadn't we weren't married then. And I, and I came up to the Customs and Border Patrol and I got a British passport, but she's Maltese, so she had a Maltese passport, dude. The shit that she got from the customs, you know, the person at customs or border patrol, whatever it's called in the UK, right? That they were like, what are you doing here? How long are you here for? What's this? Ba 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 ba. And now Malta wasn't in the EU yet, right? So we, UK was in the, in the EU, but um, Malta wasn't. And, and they were like, are you going to get married? That's what they said. And I said, I cannot wait to get out of this country right now. The way that you are grilling us and I'm coming into my own country. And I had, a, I had a return flight. I said, just, I'm not going to say on here, I'm going to try and be better. I'm trying to like temper my language. I'm, I'm just like, I can't, 
I'm going to come in. I cannot wait to get back out again, right? Because I felt, you know, and, and that wasn't even what it's like now. I mean, now yeah. it's, it's, it's insane. I mean, we, we bring in all these people in, and it's the same thing like we, we're down at the border here. It's not South American, con- you know, people from South American countries that are coming into the country. These are people that are coming all the way from Africa. They're coming all the way from the Middle East. They're coming from China. China, China, China. China. I I was wondering when you were going to bring the Trump the Trump uh, thing on. I'm not. Everyone does a Trump, right? Like, and mine's not even that good. I haven't really practiced at it. But the last person, you know, the last China. person who tried to make fun of Trump ended up shooting someone on a set of a movie. Just remember that. that I, I'm not. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't know why I'm laughing, but just saying. Uh, so, yeah, no, no, but uh, yeah, I mean, you're not, not laughing at the unfortunate. No, thing, I'm, la- I'm laughing that, at that, Trump. That's, that's, a, that's a whole uh, that's I'm a not whole laughing other... at Trump. I'm just, this is going yeah. all wrong. I like him. Actually. I know. Yeah, just stick, <laughs> listen, stick to the, stick to the, uh, the, the script. Now, so, so anyway, I want to go back to, because I haven't asked you about when you got your military cross like when you found out that you were going to be honored by oh. and by the way i just want to give props out and i i do want to say this because i know you loved this person particularly and and just the detail for the americans that are watching this like when every single person that i know that joined the military everyone that i knew in the uk they didn't well I say everyone, but the majority of them, it wasn't like I'm doing it for my country, right? It was like I'm doing it for X, Y, Z reason, whatever that might be. But, and, and Americans tend to say, I want to do it for freedom. I'm doing it for my country because I want to serve my country. But the, the majority of people that I know from the UK are not like that. But every one of them said how much they love the Queen, mm. right? I mean, the, the, the love for Queen Elizabeth II is staggering uh, among veterans in the UK and and I think we spoke about it when she when she died and it was a I've never really been a monarchist you know I, it's not it's not really been my thing you know I, it was one of those things that was just there so it's not really a priority in my life but I mean obviously it's a priority in your life when when you you know you you know she's the I believe is she the head of the army the the queen yeah yeah and Everybody that I know that served that came out just loved her, just absolutely loved her. Yeah, and it was a massive loss when she died, and 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 I felt like that as well. I felt like it was a felt like a part of me had gone, even though I've been in America now for twenty odd years, uh, and I'm an, I'm an American. Uh, mm. The Queen going was was really sad. Yeah, it was. Um... I liked her. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, and you got to meet her. Yeah, I had a long chat with her in uh, in Buckingham Palace. Actually, yeah, it was quite weird, but uh, it was it was lovely. I had a, had a, a lovely time with her. I, I think, well, I, I know, I think I know. I, I met her twice. Um, but then, so just, tell tell me about that. Tell me about tell me about like when you. Well, for, I, I want to know about your your um, I say your award, you know, your medal, and well, how I, that well, came about. I found so. out about the award. I'm just going to look at the date on here because this this throws me sometimes. Uh, Are you going to look at your book to no. see when the date was? No, I had a card in here. It must have fell. It must have fallen out. I had. A, I used to have a card in here. Um, it must have fallen out in the bookshelf when I pulled it out. But the so basically, um. I lost my 2AC on, thing is, I get the dates mixed up because I uh, I lost a guy on the 4th, the 5th and the 6th of September, a guy each day. So I, I try and, I, I, my brain can't work out if it, was, if it was him on the 4th, if it was him on the 4th, if it was him on the 5th. So, I, I mean, and I think that's part of my mental condition at the minute. I just can't work. I, that's, why I was, that's why I was looking at the book, just to see the date. Uh, I'm embarrassed about it. But basically, um, I lost uh, my 2AC on a day. The following day, I spent. I I was up all night because when I lost my two AC, my platoon sergeant 
got shrapnels all up the back. He, he, he had to go. My platoon commander was on R and R. My platoon sergeant was blown up. My two AC had just died, and there was a had a, we, we took a big hit. So that night, um, I didn't. This sounds awful. So I'll be honest. Uh, that night, I, I didn't want to cry in front of the guys. I thought that was cowardly. So I I went around bollocking the guys, get a grip of yourself, arcs. And then I'd take myself away from everyone just just to have my own little cry away from everyone and then get a grip of myself and go back. And I was up all night making sure everyone was okay. And it was the next day I was wrecked. And I remember um, the OC, uh, Blur, Major Blur, who got the DSO, turned around, are you okay? Turned around and said to me, um, there's a phone call coming for you in a few minutes. Make sure you're here. Answer the phone. Phone call for you. And I'm like, what? Uh, grab a glass of wine. Oh, see that? I'm very, very courteous. And I was like, okay. So I went to the ops room. It was a, it was a shitty little ops room. And the phone rang. And I picked up the phone. Cold, cold, sir? Ah, cold, cold. It's the uh, brigade commander here. And, I, and, and I'm like, fuck off. And hung up and walked off. <laughs> And the OC went, <laughs> I, mean, the OC, I, did, I thought it was a wind up. I'd just been through a lot of shit. My head was all over the place. Did, go and go. What happened there? Wind up, sir. Some prick pretended to be the brigade commander. He went, stop. That was the battle group commander. Get back in there now. And I'm like, what? Picked up the phone again. He rung again. He rung back. Uh, Hello, Cobra Cold? Yeah, pretty good commander. I said, really, I'm really, really sorry. I thought you were going to say, that wasn't me. I, I don't know who that was. Like, that was, some, no, that was like, no, you know, but, private, yeah. private but so-and-so. I was like, I just, it it wasn't a real net. It, it was a chat net, so it was a proper chat net. It wasn't it wasn't on the battle group net. I mean, so we could be quite formal. I just said, listen, sorry, I apologize. Uh, I've been through a lot. I just, my, my head's not in the right. Ah, oh, well, I just thought I'd phone you up and congratulate you. You've just been awarded a military cross for your work in Baghdad. Uh, I look forward to seeing you when you get back to camp. And I'm like, put the phone down. And I was like, there's a handset, green handset. And I remember going, and you'll see, shook my hand, saw me just shook my hand. He says, well, do, you, do you want me to tell anyone in your group? No, sir, please don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone in your group. Please don't tell anyone. We've got enough worries about this shit. Uh, so I just I just kept it to myself uh, and didn't tell anyone. It, it's it's How can you celebrate you've just lost your no. lost your blokes? You know what I mean? And uh if, if, if I'm honest with you, I thought it was quite callous to tell me uh, out there in the middle of what was going on, that type of news. Um, I just ignored it. But uh, I got a sat phone that night, though. I went and sat on the roof. Uh, I phoned up. I, 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 I'd lost all sort of reality what time it was in the UK. I couldn't remember. And uh, we were being hit pretty hard every day, four or five times a day. And uh, I went and sat on the roof. I just got my emotions together, and uh, I phoned. I actually phoned my parents up. It's, it's about fucking eighteen digits, digits to get through people to get there. Anyway, I didn't know my dad was in bed. He woke up and went, ah, "Hello, hello." I I'm like, sure dad. he probably thought the worst, right? You know, when you get those, know. those morning phone like, calls. He was like, "Hello, hello." I said, "Dad, it's me. It's Trevor." Oh, what's up? Doing okay? I said, "It is okay. It is okay." And he he went there. Uh, what's up? What's up? I says, "Do you want to go with me to meet the Queen?" And he went, what? Do you want to go with me to meet the Queen? So I'm asking about. What's up? Do you want to go with me to meet the Queen? What do you mean? I says, I've just been awarded military cross. My dad went, fuck off. He hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> he hung up. I was like, all right. Uh, anyway, the next well, because day... Because, it, because he's military, he knows exactly what that is, right? Like, he yeah. knows exactly he, yeah. what that means. He just went, yeah, fuck off. Yeah, he swore at me. Fuck off, hung up and went back to bed. Uh, but... I got there about eight hours soon because eight hours time in the UK papers, I was all over the UK papers about oh, really? this year. Yeah. And yeah, but then um, that's when I found out. But I, can't, I, I didn't want to go and tell the blokes that. I mean, imagine celebrating whenever you've just lost a bloke. It's just pathetic. So I just, I just ignored it. I put it at the back of my mind. And we just concentrating on, on the job in hand. Yeah. It's um, yeah. The timing's unfortunate. I I wonder why they had to do it like that. They had yeah, to do it because it was coming out in the news. I I, I don't know. Probably I mean, yeah. It, I mean, it hit the papers that that 
the following that, that morning it hit the papers. So right. I just found it all all strange and, and bad timing. I just thought, and so you come back. You can, and how long are you still in the army after that incident? Well, after that, there. I mean, after that, I came back, went on a little bit of leave. Then I went down and did platoon sergeant battle course, one of the toughest courses in the army. Went and did get my platoon sergeant, and then I went back out to Afghan with two paras, platoon sergeant. I loved it. I used to love it. I loved the thrill and the. I loved that. I loved battle. I I just I got a, a buzz from it. But it broke yeah. me in the end, didn't it? It broke me mentally in the end. Keep yeah. having to go back out. Well, you're still here. Thank God. You well, know. I'm still here. Um, yeah. I mean, it's taken me years to get into a good mental space. I was broken for... I still am a little bit broken, not a lie. But uh, to keep going and to keep moving forward, you know? As Ray Kashmir would say, you got to keep moving forward. No, it's right. Well, you know, you know, it's... um, <laughs> you, you know, I've been... I've been very fortunate to know you for some time now and we've had a lot of great conversations and um you are an incredible person you know you've worked tirelessly for others after um some of the stuff that you get as we know i'm I'm not going to i'm not going to go into it it's completely unfounded and ridiculous and and um you know sometimes it's very difficult um knowing you and knowing what you've been through to see the kind of trolling you get. I know you deal with it, you know, very well, but it's, it's absurd to me. And, um, I hope that this podcast opens you up to a new audience over in the United States, because you really are a great man. And, and, and like I said, when what you kept pushing me to do this, I was like, there's only one person that's going to be the, going to be the first person on, this podcast, and of course, I, you know, all my, you know, we wanted to do it last week, and all my, all my family got sick, and uh, and I was like, okay, and I, I haven't yet, I haven't yet, so you know, it's coming, but um, but you know, we've the conversations we've had off uh, away from any kind of like you know social media or anything like that have been really, really wonderful, and I'm I'm very grateful to have you as a friend, and and you, you know, in all seriousness, you're a real inspiration for me. Because I think you you're a you're a terrific father, you know you you genuinely are a hero, and 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 I know you hate that, which is probably why you, you you know you really are a hero, and 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 you continue to contribute so much to people that that most people will never know. They will never ever know what you do for others, and and one of the things I'm an actor. Let me talk about me. One of the things that I find so inspiring by people that have served in combat especially is their ceaseless selflessness now it's not it's not everyone right not everyone's like that but i see that in a lot of people that have served and it's it's really really inspiring to me and i think that we need that uh when we have a lot of you know a lot a lot of our society is rudderless right now, and we re- we need real leaders. We need we need people that do not live in some kind of a fantasy world, right? Some kind of a you know social construct where there's no consequences for what you do, or or certainly there's a delayed consequence in what you do. Whether that's um, mm-hmm. you know the softening of people, the lowering of standards, for example, again into the army or, or whatever that might be. Yeah. Um, you, well, Matthew, I am. You um, have. Sorry, go. On. I am. I am a really wonderful person, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> you are a really wonderful person. No, no, uh, you are though. You are. You are. And you know. And and I think well, it's important. I think it's important because you know people talk. You know, you get on these podcasts and people talk and all that. And I, yeah. I think it's it's really important to reiterate to people that don't really know you. Um, oh, there is and, days, though. There is days I'm an asshole. There, I do have days like that. Don't get me wrong. Well, we all know? do, don't we? <laughs> we all do. Mine's most days, actually. But but look, uh, Trev, I don't want to take any more of your time. I, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences with me. And, and I want to ask you if you'll come back again 
Um, we can continue on a second part of this where we can talk about yeah. what it was like when you came home and and yeah. a few of the other things that are going on right now. And, and we can talk about your books and and and, and you raising money for veterans. Um, and again, yeah. you know, the, the amount of people that you've saved when you've come home is amazing. I mean, it, it really is amazing. And um, I'm very grateful to know you, truly. Well, anytime you ask, I'll come on. I'll always do it. Uh, I mean, I'll, if, I'm humbled as well. I appreciate your friendship. I really do. I mean, we've known each other, I don't know, maybe seven, I don't know, seven plus years, whatever. But, uh, I mean, it's always, it's always nice to have a, to have a schoolboy sniper on my team. Um, it's always <laughs> lovely to have that. Yeah. But, uh, mate, I appreciate your friendship. I really do. And uh, thanks very much for having me on. Thank you. you I appreciate got it. it. You got it, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in to my, my first video. I appreciate it. And remember, not all actors are like this. I promise.